Uh, so uh, please uh, welcome uh, Professor Wen Long Jin uh, to this uh, uh, seminar today. Uh, so he uh, did his PhD at uh, UC Davis, uh, and uh, he's been uh, teaching at uh, UC Irvine since uh, 2009. 2008. Yeah, 2008. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I was still a student at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, he's he's uh, published um, many papers in uh, traffic flow theory uh, and traffic network. Which he's going to talk about today. Um, I think we have uh, editor positions in transportation science, transportation mm -hmm. research policy. Uh, so he's a very uh, top, well, uh, well renowned <laughs> expert in this field. So I'm um, uh, looking forward to the talk today. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's uh, give him a hand. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jill, and uh, thanks for. Uh, uh, having me here and uh, thanks for attending the seminar and uh, thanks for uh, attending uh, the webinar and uh, yeah I said um, actually my flight got cancelled twice so uh, I, I just arrived early this morning but I'm glad I, I made it uh, so today I would like to share with you some of our results on the new approaches in turbines in the traffic flow modeling and control so I have a lot of things to talk about. So I suppose uh, how long? Uh, I allotted like uh, one plus hours. So okay. I think, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mm, so uh, this is related to my uh, uh, recent uh, uh, studies, and uh, I will first to give a brief uh, introduction on the traffic flow modeling and control, and then I talk about you know the. Uh, 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 new perspectives on uh, uh, traffic flow modeling in uh, different types of uh, spaces and uh, actually also the corresponding uh, time scales and including in the absolute space uh, when uh, we try to develop the uh, driving model for autonomous vehicles uh, and then uh, in the relative space uh, this is uh, also relatively new uh, where we look at uh, all the trips with respect to their remaining distance to uh, destination. Uh, so this lead to so-called bathtub model, and this is closely related to um, uh, what Professor Vickery uh, uh, from Columbia University uh, did, and also it's a pretty uh, hot topic, which is uh, um, kind of revived by uh, Berkeley School, Professor Carlos Daganzo and, uh, and many of his students. And then the third one is related to, you know, to look at uh, the day-to-day uh, -day departure time choice. And uh, we, we know that, you know, probably, I don't know uh, if you guys commute or not, you guys might have a good housing close to campus. That probably is necessary <laughs> for their driving and, uh, you know, parking. So, you know, uh, uh, transit, yeah, I know. That, 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 that just makes sense. You know, since I come from California, the first thing is really fine, you know. Uh, but you know, the parking part just killed me. Um, and also, I noticed that you know, I'm using GPS navigation you know, in this uh, uh, urban canyon you know, type of thing, you know, where it's not reliable at all. It's not reliable. Yeah, you, you, that's, uh, but anyways, I mean, people make a lot of choices, including weather driving or, uh, you know, uh, transit, you know, the, these different choices. Obviously, you know, New Yorkers and the California, we have different types of choices on that. But, you know, what is uh, common is that, you know, we, we, when we commute, especially for relatively long commute, we need to choose our departure time, whether we arrive early, you know, then get, on, get into office a little bit earlier, uh, you know, or we, uh, you know, leave a little bit later and then waste more time on the way. I, I think even with the subway, with all those things, uh, there should also be some congestion. So there's a trade-off between the congestion cost and the uh, so-called scheduling cost. And whether we arrive early or late, there will be the associated penalty type of thing. So it turns out, you know, this kind of choice uh, can be uh, transformed uh, into a, uh, a traffic flow problem uh, in a different space. Uh, in a, you know, I have two attempts so far. One is look at 
uh, how people uh, you know, navigate in the uh, uh, imaginary space, which is related to the scheduling cost. Okay, people from day to day uh, want to uh, you know lower their scheduling cost. That that kind of makes sense. And then uh, that turns out actually is similar uh, to uh, when we are driving uh, on the road. Uh, when when there is uh, for example when uh, there, there is a red light and we try to get close to the intersection, you know, those kind of driving behavior. And then another attempt is to directly look use of departure times within a day as a space. Uh, and then uh, I developed a new uh, this uh, model. And this uh, is another actually uh, traffic flow model. So you, you, you can see that you know, these uh, traffic flow models are not traditional traffic flow models anymore, uh, where we look at uh, cars driving on the road, whether you know, absolute space or value state, that is still with respect to the distance. Actually, we can also look at how people change their choices in a different type of spaces. Uh, and uh, th those choices uh, are close to, you know, are very important for transportation system uh, performance and then for the planning, for the management and the regulation and so on. And if time allows, I, I would be happy to discuss about two operations in the control problem. Uh, one is uh, uh, related to high occupancy toll lanes. Mm. Uh, and uh, basically the dynamic you know, pricing scheme or um, responsive you know, pricing scheme. And then the, the other one is the shared mobility system, uh, free size uh, management. So maybe uh, I will be a little bit kind of uh, quick with uh, uh, the traffic flow models. I, I, I understand that you know, traffic flow models is uh, you know, important because I'm pretty biased <laughs> uh, as they are. Uh, however, they may not be uh, so interesting compared with, for example, shared mobility system where you, know, you guys uh, might be uh, directly interested. So, you know, this is the LA network, not the same as the Manhattan, downtown Manhattan uh, network. Uh, here's a lot of car traffic. But, you know, the, the point is that, you know, every day the congestion test, you know, congestion pattern is a uh, you know relatively kind of uh, stationary or, or 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 can be a repeating the pattern is uh, really clear uh, from uh, for example from seven to ten or even six to ten I mean, there will be congestion and the congestion location the queue length you know, everything uh, is relatively consistent from day to day so that just shows that you know in the transportation system there there's some you know, pattern some stability um, that is um, uh, working there. And then, of course, we know that now the transportation system is quite different uh, from the early years. But actually, when I check out Victor's archive, he's been writing about transportation since 1950s, 60s, so on. So he already considered a lot of things, including the privacy with respect to you know, the uh, toll collection. So that, you know, the, the issues have been around, but UC Davis uh, consider uh, we are undergoing three you know, revolutions, electrification, automation, and shared mobility. So uh, today uh, I, I will cover uh, automation, you know, autonomous vehicles, and the shared mobility, and not much so on the uh, electrification. And uh, you know, in the transportation system, there are a lot of stakeholders, right? But uh, you know, the, which is uh, most visible again in California are the cost one in the world. And uh, this is the mascot of uh, you know, New Zealand uh, and theater. And uh, then uh, you know, uh, we know that you know, for our cars to run on the road, not only we need to build the infrastructure, we also need to manage them well because you know when there is a congestion during the uh, peak period uh, there is uh, externality in terms of congestion cost and also you know, the environmental uh, costs uh, the emissions and so on and uh, also health related costs and then that leads to you know inequality too right 
So um, how to deal with uh, all these issues? So we really need to have the collaboration uh, among the different stakeholders. But at the same time, I mean, there are competitions too. So there's a, um, a cooperative uh, competition at the job uh, of study um, auction theory and uh, game theory. Uh, on this, so uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting problems in our transporting system. So, as I said, transporting system is really a nice uh, playground where you know computer scientists, you know, now in the days for AI, you know, many computer scientists are getting here, and uh, you know, and even my background, I was from applied mathematics, and I feel that is uh, really. A, uh, fantastic, and of course, I mean, civil engineering and many other disciplines can find a lot of interesting problems in transportation system. And then at the same time, uh, the model of transportation, the regulation of transportation, and so on, the policy, many of this, uh, even in terms of fundamental research, it actually, um, you know, a lot of people from other areas make uh, really fundamental contributions uh, into our area too. And you know, in, in, in some you know situation, we would argue that we many of the times, especially the methods, we are borrowing a lot from economics, from mathematics, from you know all these kind of areas. So and then, but you know, in the transportation, uh, I consider at the core of the transportation are related to the choice behaviors, as I earlier talked about of uh, travelers. And the travelers' choice behavior, there are many choice behaviors related to, you know, for example, where we are going to choose our house, uh, you know, the, the mode choice, you know, departure time choice, and when we are on the road to choose a land and so on, speed and so on. So uh, basically, you know, the, we, we really have a, you know, very complex system of uh, social, economic, and engineering, and then uh, there are all kinds of uh, you know, performance. And many of uh, you know this performance actually they might be a conflict in each other, so that makes uh, things very challenging. Uh, but at the same time, we also have a lot of detectors. We are you know, collecting a lot of data and try to understand the situation, and then compare with the you know uh, desired performance, and then uh, you know for our transportation engineers, civil engineer, many of the times we need to design the control management, you know pricing, you know, and all this kind of. Uh, uh, ways to improve the performance. But uh, we, we understand this is a very dynamic uh, system, and uh, there are you know, the first order consequences, the second order, and maybe unexpected, such as you know, induced demand, and uh, all of the things. So this is never ending. But uh, this is a, a good news for us, right? So you know, whenever there's a congestion, there's a problem, then there's a job, and then there are interesting problems. And including you know, COVID-19 that has been changing, has changed the you know the transportation pattern you know, a lot. And, um, and also at the same time, it poses maybe uh, a lot of challenges, including in I feel you know, the virus, maybe again. And I, I'm not sure if my feeling is correct. You know, many drivers are not as good as before, you know, things like that. So that will lead to some safety and all these kind of challenges. Then, you know, um, transportation, as many other disciplines, uh, we can take advantage of different scientific research methods. Right? The, uh, you know, the basic one is the so called first principle uh, approach. Uh, you know, this is like a Newtonian. Uh, paradigm uh, built on three uh, laws using three laws and then we can derive you know, really uh, sophisticated uh, results and predict the trajectory of uh, you know the moon and you know earth and so on so uh, basically you know this is to discover the fundamental principle that govern the, uh, you know, the world around us uh, and uh, and this, uh, you know, many of the times we need to use uh, analytic methods uh, to uh, do the derivation and so on. And then the second approach now is pretty popular is data driven and uh, especially machine learning, you know, artificial intelligence. Many of the studies are based on this one. This is uh, very important and uh, uh, is uh, complementary uh, to the uh, first analytic approach. 
And now with the, you know, the development of computers, numerical simulation methods are getting also more uh, and more important. So you, you can see that in the interim condition, we are really using all of these uh, approaches, right? So um, first principle, you know, in science, in engineering, in mathematics, right? uh, 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 the uh, basic geometry, you know, we, we use uh, five axiom or something, and to try to divide a lot of uh, you know, results. So, you know, in a, a, in a transportation, many times we do not talk about principles, but, you know, in, uh, if you read many articles, uh, they generally start with discussions on assumptions, um, you know, uh, postulates and hypotheses. Those are, you know, can be considered as consistent as uh, with the uh, uh, principles. So actually, much of my research is related to first principle uh, approach and try to um, understand uh, the uh, dynamics in a transportation system based on a uh, few principles uh, that is related to the driving behavior, related to safety, related to choice behavior, and so on. Uh, and so on. So, um, we also use, we also analyze data, but many of the times we really use the data to uh, do relatively traditional things like the calibration and the validation. Not really uh, try to use big data to discover the new laws, new principles, uh, which is obviously very, very important. And uh, now it's pretty uh, you know, hot topic. So mm, the first one is related to autonomous vehicles uh, driving behavior. So uh, we, we know that you know autonomous vehicles they can be you know, very um, helpful if uh, re realized, but they also have a lot of challenges. One is related to safety, and uh, you, you guys might have heard that you know, Tesla you know, actually has um, some high-profile uh, accidents, and uh, they have uh, one lawsuit. I have not followed, right? but. Uh, related to who would be responsible if uh, you know uh, the driver using autopilot and you know, kill you know, pedestrians. And now there's uh, you know, debate on that, and uh, obviously uh, there, there will be a, you know, huge uh, consequences uh, on the whole uh, industry. So, um, and then you know, while uh, Tesla car has uh, you know these accidents, and uh, in, in comparison. And Google, Waymo, their car actually pretty safe. And the last time I checked that, they were only rear-ended by others because they are driving too slow. <laughs> that is also a problem. So how to drive safely and then at the same time, as fast as possible. Uh, that still uh, is a, a very challenging task. So, you know, talking about safety, you know, generally human drivers uh, probability of fatality probably is uh, one over one million. And uh, people would expect autonomous vehicles to reach three magnitude better uh, than that. So basically that means it's about uh, you know, one fatality per 30 uh, billion miles. Uh, and uh, you know, if this can be uh, really uh, realized, then you know, the uh, traffic system, transportation system can be uh, much more efficient. Uh, for example, by just uh, reducing the um, uh, reaction time, uh, is actually a time pattern. We can uh, improve uh, the uh, capacity, uh, almost uh, almost double the capacity. Basically, is that you know, just like building you know, another you know lane. And uh, but you know in the near future, at least we will have uh, you know mixed traffic here with autonomous vehicles and. Uh, and a human driven vehicle. So ideally, we want to have a you know, human like uh, type you know, driving uh, uh, behavior. So, mm, yeah, so we are looking at the driving task. You know, for example, just a simple car following situation. Of course, I mean, even simpler would be cruising, but cruising is not that you know, uh, interesting in terms of practical. If we have a look at uh, car following, and then uh, you know we have sensing, planning, and uh, action. So you know planning basically is to determine what's the speed the car want to have in the next uh, second 
or next time step, depending on the time step. Uh, so once uh, this target speed is set, and then uh, you know the action part is to use uh, some control theory and so on. So basically, the, the point is that right now, you know, um, uh, the uh, sensing uh, part using sensors, this can be tested offline. Okay, while action definitely is online, meaning that it is in the real world. Uh, however, you know, with the current uh, electrical mechanical um, uh, actuators, actually this action, this control part is pretty accurate. Uh, but there's a gap between this, which will be the uh, planning side. Okay, so right now the AI based method, I can use statistic method to plan it, but we know that you know, to plan the driving trajectory, including speed acceleration, uh, can be very challenging, especially for so-called corner cases or you know, relatively rare uh, events. But to achieve those one over one uh, billion, um, you know, this uh, fatality rate, we need to consider those things. There, there is a lot of work uh, in uh, this area. But you know, basically, if we are going to use the statistic data driven method, that means if we are going to change a line of code. Then we have to test this, test this again for 30 uh, billion miles. Uh, however, another approach, if we are trying to use a first principle case approach, we uh, could achieve so called mathematically guaranteed safety. Okay, so no need to uh, have field tests. And, uh, but uh, uh, on this, there's no uh, uh, existing framework that can achieve this goal. So actually, there, there are uh, you know, different types of uh, planning models, including traditional car falling models, but that to cruise control and uh, you know, AI-based models. Uh, AI-based models uh, have the, you know, the challenge uh, in terms of you know, the, the testing. And uh, uh, adaptive cruise control is a little heuristic, and uh, actually, uh, they have different components, and uh, there's no closed form formulations. In contrast, the car model, if you uh, learn uh, taking a pressure flow model, maybe a general motor model, even though in general motor model is fundamentally wrong in terms of uh, safety uh, issue, and later I will get to that. However, uh, they have a relatively simple equations. So uh, nonlinear ordinary differential equations most of the time. So um, we are trying to, you know, uh, trying to uh, extend this one. Uh, to analyze the existing car falling models to see if we satisfy uh, the safety uh, constraint. Uh, if not, how we can uh, improve it. So basically that's the one line of uh, research. And we realized that this safety issue is uh, after, you know, I supervised one uh, master student uh, from uh, mechanical engineering. And he uh, helped to assemble a bunch of uh, robotic cars, and then uh, I help him to implement uh, those uh, 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 car falling models, including general motor models, and then test it. But the, in this one, um, I believe there's no uh, congestion, but uh, I mean, no uh, collision, but you can see that there's a lot of uh, abrupt um, deceleration and stops, and uh, you know, uh, Definitely, this is not uh, uh, not comfortable, and we don't believe the human drivers will drive this badly. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, but actually, we have a other, but I cannot find uh, cannot find the one. Actually, the cars are actually climbing each other. I don't know if you guys are playing with the simulation, you know, like a pyramids, like a, you know, uh, AMSA, those things, it, it's, uh, and we. And actually, sometimes you know, cars you know they are on top of each other, you know. But you know, in simulation, who cares, right? And also, we uh, use those mostly for planning for those kind of things. So we look at the microscopic aggregate of the thing; it does not matter. So I did not, you know, uh, you know, was not really uh, how to say shocked or things, but. After we implement this uh, on this robot car to see that they really collide into each other, we realize that you know this traditional models definitely cannot be used to control this uh, robotic cars. So um, as I said, they can be useful planning for this operation thing, but not for that. So 
Uh, how we want to get started? We want to start with the first uh, principle. Actually, this first principle uh, is not new. Actually, as early as 1945, you know, two physicists uh, actually uh, wrote an article that's talked about the principles of physics applied to traffic movement. So, first principles. That's not surprising because first principles. Uh, initiated you know, originally in a physics study. So they define the safe solving distance, and then uh, this will lead to no rear end collision. And actually, this also leads to from the back. Um, um, no time to get into details, but in the trifle, we know that you know, from the diagram, it's a really, really fundamental, uh, really fundamental relationship. So uh, this uh, safe solving you know, thing. Uh, Safe stopping distance criteria actually uh, uh, is uh, very intuitive, very uh, straightforward, and at the same time can lead to some uh, you know, very uh, sophisticated uh, results. So, in this gets you, you know, how to represent the thing. You know, uh, basically, in the traffic flow, we have uh, you know, the time, uh, location, and uh, the uh, uh, flow. Right. So, uh, you know, these three variables, uh, there are two uh, independent and the one dependent. So this actually leads to, you know, the flow-based models, trajectory-based models, like car volume models, and schedule-based models I mean, for uh, uh, the uh, transit buses and uh, subways. Many times we use uh, uh, schedule-based models. So there's an equivalence. And then, you know, the first principles, uh, we start with a very simple, like a collision free condition and the speed should be bounded. Uh, generally, no negative, no backward no traveling. And uh, there's a speed limit. And then there's a fundamental diagram. And also, you know, we have bounded acceleration, deceleration. And uh, actually, to drive comfortably, we need to have bounded joint and so on. So uh, this makes sense. Uh, intuitively, and actually, uh, these are implemented in the adaptive cruise control you know, development. And you know, for uh, those um, uh, develop those uh, driving assistant uh, systems, uh, these are also implemented. At the same time, uh, they can be uh, uh, verified with uh, real world data. So, um, and so we, we start with this, and then uh, you know we uh, try to talk about it. For example, the clean and free condition uh, actually uh, uh, leads to uh, some uh, constraints on uh, how we should solve the car volume model, how we should solve uh, the LWR model and all those models in order to be uh, clean and free. And then uh, this uh, is actually consistent and with the well-known conditions in the mathematics. While in the mathematics, these conditions uh, were derived to um, make sure the numerical method actually is so-called consistent and stable so that the results converge. But here, actually, we can derive this thing from the safety principle, for example. So, um, yeah, and actually uh, the safety principle is more physically meaningful uh, if we have different types of fundamental diagram. And uh, another, uh, uh, another uh, serious work that I did is, uh, you know, if we add this uh, bounded acceleration into the model, you know, earlier those were related to the speed, the spacing, and those are all first order. Uh, thing. If we add the bounded acceleration to it, actually we can uh, um, uh, model the so-called capacity drop phenomenon. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware of that. When there are congestion forms, actually the capacity of uh, a botnet actually is uh, reduced. Um, and uh, this actually uh, from this analysis, uh, we can uh, predict the trajectory inside such kind of a uh, uh, bottleneck, and this matches uh, the trajectories uh, observed in Japan in the 1980s pretty well. Uh, that one was in a tunnel bottleneck, uh, which also has this capacity bulk phenomenon. And uh, so on. And uh, then uh, 
uh, my uh, former, now my former PhD student, uh, Irene Magnus, and uh, she's uh, been uh, using this model to try to find the optimal location for our variable spin limits. We know that if uh, you know the very spin limit zone is uh, uh, too far away, too much upstream, then you know the queue created by this uh, VSL zone will block the off ramp uh, upstream. So that's not good. But if it's too close, it actually you may not be able to have to um, uh, have to address the capacity drop phenomenon. So uh, we uh, formulate one optimization problem and with uh, the first principles of traffic flow as constraints. And then we were able to find uh, the meaningful optimal location for variable spins. And then uh, this is not enough. Uh, you know, if we do not consider bounded deceleration, because we know that if a car has an infinite deceleration, then there should be no accident or at least a rear end collision accident. Uh, the accident is just because people have, you know, the car uh, and people have a uh, you know, boundary uh, uh, reaction time, uh, uh, finite reaction time and boundary deceleration. So this is still ongoing work. And uh, anyway, this turns out to be much more challenging and then uh, just add um, boundary deceleration into uh, the, the, the equation uh, because only deceleration, as I said earlier, uh, is a conflict with uh, safety. So how can we uh, make sure to have a boundary deceleration and uh, have the safety at the same time? So uh, that is what we are trying to figure out. And then this gets to, uh, you know, the, uh, like um, some um, critic, um, you know, uh, criticism and the resurrection of second order models. I don't know if you guys learned about it. I mean, definitely, I guess, uh, you know, back in 1995, criticized the second order continuum models in that they do not satisfy the anisotropic condition. This means that the information in the traffic flow should travel from you know, downstream towards upstream. That, that generally makes sense because we observe, we follow the leader. We you know, rarely, this is because. Or, uh, uh, we rarely, you know, rarely care about our flow, but sometimes we do. Mm, uh, you know, mm, uh, but now I, I think you know many of uh, this criticism and the restoration actually miss uh, the point because you know, turns out all this model, including general motor model, um, they uh, still violate the first principles, including the safety principles. So um, basically, in our area, there's no agreement on what should be first principles. <laughs> yeah, very few people talk about first principles. Uh, yes, uh, uh, this is very important. Uh, another one, okay, I get, guess I should be really clear. I have already talked about this uh, briefly. The basic idea is you know, very simple. You know, right now, to model the network, private flow, in a network, uh, we need to have at least one equation for one link, and then we have many thousands of equations. But the idea is that in this in this model, that we can have just one equation for the whole network. But yeah, the price we have to pay is that we are losing uh, track of vehicles on their origin, destination, routes, and link. We just know their relative uh, position on their own route. And then with that simplification, actually all uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, trips, for example, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, they are served by four high vehicles, these two trips, uh, Alice and Bob, these two trips, they have a totally different origin destination and so on. But if we look at the remaining distance to destination and with respect to time, we can put their trips in the same space-time diagram. And we can do this for many, many trips in the whole network. And this how to simplify, but still give us the aggregate view of the congestion level. For example, if we look at the average speed, and then we will have an idea about the congestion uh, in the whole area. 
This kind of simplification makes sense for a downtown area. We know that during the rush hour, all streets are pretty much you know, congested. And maybe not to the level of a second because the red light, uh, you know, uh, green light, uh, there, there will be a difference. But if we look at, for example, every 10 minutes, the average speed on different streets probably uh, can be uh, comparable. So uh, during the rush hour or non rush hour. So with this simplification, and then we can have use of Y equation to describe the traffic flow in the whole network. Of course, this is still a partial differential equation because it changes with time and with space. So this comes with the three assumptions. One is the relative space, is that we are using another space dimension. And uh, this actually is uh, used to call, used to uh, so-called beta law. I don't know if you guys heard of the term. This was coined by uh, Vickery back in the 1990s. And uh, the, the best top name totally inspired by this Manhattan Island because it looks like best top is it, right. So um, basically, he just wants to look at the downtown, the, the whole Manhattan Island the transportation network as one entity, as one best top, and then look at you know, the flares in the best top. So this analogy totally makes sense. And then another assumption is a so-called network from the diagram. Basically means that we, we, we assume the average speed in the whole uh, best top is determined by the uh, number of cars in the network. That roughly is correct. The more cars getting into uh, you know, the Manhattan Island and the more congested it is, the uh, speed is lower. And then, of course, another one is the conservation law. And then from uh, this thing, and then we can derive uh, this generalized platform. I don't have time to get into this. And actually, this is related to my business here. And uh, uh, turns out, you know, um, uh, he, uh, Vickery, had an unpublished note back in the 1991 uh, and also 1994. Uh, but, you know, this, has, uh, this type of model has become very popular these days uh, in the name of MFD, Microscopic Phenomenon Diagram. Now, I don't know if you guys heard about it, and uh, uh, you know, Professor Kost Daganzo and uh, Nicholas Jerlinis, they have uh, uh, done a lot of work and uh, you know, made a lot of contribution on it. But it turns out, uh, and actually uh, Vickery uh, had this model, exactly the same model, uh, almost two decades earlier, and also Vickery uh, had much deeper insights, more accurate uh, description on the assumption, especially on the trip distance in a network, you know, what is the distribution of trip distance turns out to be very, very important. Vickery uh, realized that um, he has to assume so-called negative exponential distribution of trip distance. Then that leads to one ordinary differential equation. But in uh, uh, Daganzo's work, he just mentioned about negative exponential distribution at once, but not explicitly. And then that's why after that, many people have used this model using their model, which is an ordinary differential equation model, to describe the traffic dynamics by assuming all trips have the same length. That is another simple case, right? In intuitive. But actually, that is wrong. Now we know that if all trips are the same length, then we don't have, we cannot use uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, ordinary differential equation. So in this sense, Vickery um, had it earlier and uh, better, but uh, it was just not noticed. Um, it's unpublished, but it's archived. So I, you know, I got, um, to know this because uh, you were cited by four or five times by mostly by uh, Professor Richard Arnold and, and his group. Uh, and then uh, I, I contacted the rare book in the Chile Library of Columbia and I got a copy of them. And um, then I realized oh, you know, the concepts and the ideas, assumptions in that paper uh, were uh, very, very uh, fundamental. Uh, and then uh, yeah, I uh, try to generalize. So, you know, 
if you learn the traffic flow model, we know that a uh, WR model is very fundamental, uh, but that describes uh, the dynamics, um, describe the interaction at the local level. But the generalized better model basically describe assume there's some non-local interaction uh, among uh, vehicles. And um, so they are comparable. And then uh, basically this leads to actually a new paradigm for transportation system analysis. Traditionally, we look at origin, destination, routes, links, right? So now with this simplification, maybe we can move away from it. And definitely there's there will be a you know, price to pay. And uh, we we are we, we lost uh, all these details of natural topology. However, this can be very useful for large scale transportation system operation and uh, planning too. And another thing actually um, is related to privacy preserving. You know, if we have this trajectory in so-called relative space, we don't know which route each vehicle is on at any time. We only know their distance to their destination. Uh, so this kind of data is still useful for describing natural uh, level of traffic, but does not reveal any personally identifiable location information. So this actually preserves privacy. Actually, this is one uh, direction we are exploring and how can we have privacy preserving uh, methods for collecting traffic data, for sharing traffic data, and so on. And uh, hopefully this can help uh, you know, more private companies, government agencies, you know, researchers, and uh, to share the data. And it also encourage you know, passengers to share their data too. If, if, if we uh, um, can make sure that their privacy is uh, preserved. So I don't have time to get to you know, the day-to-day -day departure choice and so on, but you know, the basic message is that uh, other choices, even though it's not driving, actually could also be a traffic flow problem. As long as there's a dynamics, there's a conservation. Uh, so that is a very, uh, something very interesting. Right. And um, then, you know, another um, study, uh, a new one, uh, you know, using the within daytime, the touch time as a space, uh, that is also inspired by the Vickers 91 paper. Actually, the Vickers 91 paper has four sections. Yeah, I consider each of the sections a, a significant contribution. That's their state of art. And so that's why we are, uh, I co-edited co with Professor Richard and get it published in the Journal of uh, Transporting Economics. Yeah, so, um, uh, that, yeah. And uh, this morning I went to the library and checked. Actually, you know, when I saw that paper, I was, you know, amazed by, you know, the knowledge and all the things uh, in, in that paper, right? But I checked uh, his other, Manuscripts, even handwritten notes back in the 1960s, 70s, he already had many of those basic ideas. There. And uh, I feel that, you know, for example, all of that paper was on the congestion pricing, on marginal cost um, pricing of a transportation network. And then, first thing he developed a model, simple model for the network. That is a best model. And then he talked about you know, the pricing. And even uh, in the fourth uh, section, he even developed a new, uh, uh, a novel numerical method for solving problem differential equations. So um, I talked to a mathematician from Columbia University. He was also amazed because that is his major research area. Um, he, he, very recently, he's still developing you know, those methods of victory. I believe he had been discovered back in the 1990s. But of course, he said that you know the original ideas, the similar ideas already appeared back in the 1940s, but in 1990 was still pretty early. But you know, I was uh, very impressed by the way he approached the problem. And you, I don't know if you know that Vigor is an economist, but he has you know deep interest in transportation. He studied all aspects of transportation, also many aspects. 
including subway, bus, you know, air, you know, airlines, parking, a, and traffic flow, and all sorts of things. And it seems that he starts with a problem, and then he, uh, you know, outlines some basic principles. He gives core principles on uh, what the solution should look like. For example, he considers the pricing, the dynamic pricing should vary smoothly. You know, with all these things, and then he developed the models and the solutions and so on. So I consider his approach also kind of first principle based approach. But of course, he had great insights, intuition on um, defining the right set of the principles. And so, yeah, there are many uh, possible uh, extensions uh, uh, along that line. Uh, along the line by uh, viewing transportation as a traffic level problem. <laughs> so I just said that, okay, I'm biased, I'm, I'm considering traffic flow theories, but now I say, okay, given your transportation problem, I might be able to convert it to a traffic flow problem. So maybe that is you know, my ultimate goal. But you know, it's a very encouraging from uh, this uh, experience. Yeah. So next, based on you know these models, especially you know the uh, best model, uh, we can uh, design some control methods like uh, uh, pricing schemes of uh, high occupancy tolerance. Uh, I don't know if there are express lanes uh, on this course too, right? They are getting more and more popular. I don't have that in chart. I mean, some some favorites. Some proofs, yeah, more uh, getting more and more popular, and then you, I think you know that uh, four or five miles converting the actual land to hot So, um, in California, I believe SR 91, stay route 91 in Southern California will be one of the first, if not the first, to implement this. So, I mean, traditionally, if we want to even just model one corridor. We uh, need to have a set one equation for each segment. For example, you know, if we are not using half volume model for, if we are using half volume in the lane chain model, just micro so called microscopic model, then we have we need to have uh, one equation for each vehicle. Uh, but if we are using so called self transmission model, um, those, those models based on LWR model, network based network LWR model, then we need to have one equation for one uh, segment. Now. Uh, with uh, this uh, beta model, we try to model the whole corridor as one entity and using one equation for general purpose land, one equation for the hot land. And then look at that, how you know, the single occupancy vehicles will choose to pay to use hot land or not pay, but you know, stay on the more congested uh, general purpose land. So that's the basic idea. And then um, we, we, we design uh, you know, uh, the control strategies. Of course, this control strategy is based on real-time feedback. Okay, we, we don't assume, you know, nobody can predict the demand, right? Or at least not that accurately and in real time. So we try to narrow the congestion level uh, on the general purpose layer and the hard layer, and then compare it and then uh, decide whether we want to increase uh, the uh, price or decrease the price. And uh, then, of course, it turns out the price should be uh, distance uh, related, right? the longer distance, the long, uh, the, the higher um, total price. So uh, that is the one. And then I, I will try to spend a little more time to talk about this one. Maybe, uh, the share mobility system. This is another uh, attempt that we made to try to model the complex uh, system with uh, you know four higher vehicles. And we know that with the four higher vehicle system, it naturally becomes more complicated because now the driver and the vehicle they are kind of or, or passenger and vehicle they are separated. So there is a waiting process. Passenger needs to wait for the cars for higher vehicles to arrive. Or there is a there is also match between the vehicles and the passengers. So 
this is more complicated. We can now simply uh, use the beta model, for example, for the Manhattan Island for, you know, for broken downtown. There is a downtown you know, for broken too, right? Mm -hmm. So not like urban. You know, I don't know where it's the downtown or urban. Yeah, this, this is downtown. This is downtown, yeah. So maybe for the downtown area, uh, you know, if for um, a privately operated vehicle, we can use a single BESA model to reasonably approximate it. However, for uh, when we have a shared mobility system, we have this matching and you know uh, share and and the waiting process. Uh, we need to consider uh, the dynamics of uh, not only cars on the road and also the waiting and the matching dynamics. Basically. So uh, the the idea basically is that you know we have a uh, different kind of mobility and we have privately. And operated vehicles, four high vehicles, right? And uh, <clears throat> and uh, there, there, there. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there, there is this thing that you know the interactions between four high vehicles and transportation systems actually uh, are not that well understood, or say there are conflicting views uh, in the literature. You know, we know that the TNCs have three big claims, right? To reduce the car ownership, you know, with the introduction of Uber, to reduce the car ownership and increase the public transit and ridership and reduce congestion. That is when they started back in the 2005 or, you know, or sometime like that, right? But after a decade or so of running, we found that you know, all results are opposite. <laughs> Right, so that is the unexpected thing, like the induced demand or whatever. So uh, they increase the uh, you know, car ownership, decrease the public transit ridership, and also increase the congestion. So here we try to understand why they would increase uh, the um, congestion. Because you know, there's some merit to their claim. If uh, you know with four higher vehicles, we can uh, arrange the car pooling, the pooling better. That should be able to reduce the number of cars on the road. Should reduce congestion, right? But why is not? And you know, it turns out that is related to not only pooling. And the uh, pooling definitely is very positive for the system performance. However, there are some dead head miles, you know, the, um, uh, those kind of export, you know, uh, mileage, they will, uh, they will increase congestion. Those are negative impacts. So we need to consider, you know, uh, the interaction between the positive and negative impacts. And uh, we are trying to develop a model that um, can help to, you know, quantify uh, the impacts. Uh, and we also introduce uh, the uh, a couple of uh, concepts on this. So yeah, I said I mean uh, either relief congestion or actually worsening uh, congestion. So uh, reality versus you know the ideal situation. So um, but you know in the literature there have been a lot of studies, but mostly uh, based on simulation, based on very detailed Microsoft simulation and so on. So uh, no uh, simple. Uh, analysis because with simulation, as I uh, said earlier, simulation and numeric methods are very important. Consider now as a third type of method, scientific research. But many of the time, uh, actually, we lose the big picture. We don't know what kind of assumptions that we are making, or then we cannot check whether the assumption is reasonable or not. So, um, so basically, uh, we, we we try to look at. You know, the pooling ratios, we actually define you know, how to define the pooling ratio. Okay, whether it's greater than one, when we, it's we, we one, basically one person using one car. If it's greater than one, then multiple people are sharing the car. And then uh, there's the extra dead head in the tour miles. So extra mileage ratio. We also define this one. And then we look at, you know, why the current practice of TLCs they have three size management scheme. Uh, basically, they try to you know limit the waiting time of passengers because that is highly related to passenger satisfactory level. 
you know, or the level of service and the nice of the customer. But it turns out this kind of practice, this kind of free size management scheme and actually are not very healthy if the pooling ratio is smaller with respect to the extra mileage ratio. So uh, we try to answer you know, this question and reconcile the conflict with us. Basically, in that there are merits in uh, both type of claims, just that they actually uh, are correct under different types of assumptions. So we try to understand on what kind of assumptions actually we can help to relieve congestion, on what kind of conditions we actually will worsen the congestion. And also try to propose the uh, you know free size management scheme for future. So um, still, um, maybe I should. Yeah, the basic ideas are there. And uh, yeah, as I said earlier, now we basically have uh, you know, uh, three layers of demand supply thing. Before there's only you know the demand and the supply. Uh, supply or by infrastructure demand because now we have a, a so called uh, driver vehicle unit or traveler in QVs, uh, they consider to be one unit. Now, with the introduction of FHVs, we introduce a flexibility, but at the same time, introduce challenges. So, some question uh, should I answer the uh, colleague question? Sure. Or? Yeah. A uh, raised hand. Can I? Uh, can, can, can we are that in? Yeah, just click on the Q and A. Uh, Q and A. Yeah. yeah. So scroll down. <laughs> A lot of questions. Uh, maybe. Oh, but about Ronnie raised hand. Is that uh, how? She... Oh. You, did you see that thing? Or? Yeah, uh, maybe if uh, if that person can type in the question in Q and A. Okay. Yeah. Let, let's wait a bit. Okay. Yeah, I will try to quickly wrap you. Basically, now we we have a you know the dynamics and we have matching and so on and um, and uh, in the end uh, we would have. Two types of uh, dynamics: uh, one for the waiting process, the other for traveling uh, in the network. And uh, maybe uh, what is relevant is that uh, you know for the pooling ratio, uh, I have time to talk about this. And actually, you know, for such kind of uh, situation, uh, we can uh, mm, look at the empty vehicle miles, full vehicle miles, and the passenger miles, and also the distances. Uh, that you know of the travelers that would be served uh, by private operating vehicles by comparing all of this, and then we can have the pooling ratio, extra mileage ratio, and uh, then we can look at how if we are um, have a, you know often one no car pooling, uh, often two there's a pooling, and uh, you know whether that can help to improve to reduce capacity reduction. Okay. But you know, in this example, just be, because we have a lot of extra miles, so you know, it actually you make you will reduce the capacity. But in this case, with the pooling actually helps to improve condition. But under certain situations, if it involves a lot of detour, we can imagine that actually it's not good. So basically, uh, you know, we, we can define this, and uh, it turns out this ratio uh, becomes very important for determining the system performance. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think there's a fundamental diagram. Yeah, here. So basically, uh, this G is uh, the trip service rate per hour. And uh, this lambda is basically the density, okay, density. And then uh, this is the fundamental diagram, uh, the lower one with uh, four higher vehicles. And then this one is uh, with the uh, QVs. 
And uh, basically, in this case, the pooling um, is uh, smaller than the actual mileage. So the overall capacity actually is reduced. That's why the system becomes more congested. But of course, uh, under certain situations, if managed well, we could actually uh, increase the capacity. So um, I guess, um, yeah, I will um, uh, start with that discussion. So, you know, if, when we design the next generation transportation system, we are facing a lot of opportunities with the evolutions, but we are also facing a lot of challenges because the system gets more and more complicated, right? And uh, the system could have uh, un totally unexpected, totally opposite results. And so actually they just suggest that we need to have better models and better control schemes. And uh, uh, I, you know, at this time, I think in the first principles, including the autonomous vehicles, as I talked about earlier, uh, if we are using statistic-based method versus mathematical guarantee, a safety um, approach. Uh, definitely, you know, uh, the um, second approach, the first principle approach, still have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, merits and uh, more in, in importance. So then we want to also, you know, carefully define um, the concepts and develop new models, you know, just like uh, what we could do. Uh, you know, he, he wanted to solve a new problem. Uh, and uh, he gave up his own model. And uh, it looks like we might have to do the same thing. You know, for, for example, we, we did try uh, you know, with the four high vehicles, and then also we need to develop these new methods. And actually, you know, we might want to look at more fundamental issues on how we look at the space, how we look at the time. Okay. So, um, yeah, so basically, you know, said in the traditional physics, space time is very important. Uh, you know, in the transportation system, actually, we have another dimension that is related to the flow of vehicles, flow of passengers, and so on. So we really have this, uh, you know, space time flow uh, situation. So maybe that suggests our problems are more complicated than general relativity <laughs> and all those problems. Uh, but anyway, there's a potential for that. Uh, and also, you know, even like, uh, you know, now we are looking at the, you know, the equity, and how should we uh, look at equity, narrow equity? Uh, so how, it sounds like, you know, there's also some dynamics, social dynamics, people, move you know in the social climb social ladders you know like moving social uh, state so how should we define it and how should we uh, look at the dynamics and so on so uh, you know many of the study in the transportation traffic flow could give us some hints uh, on uh, all these issues and this is totally relevant for us because now we are you know uh, trying to improve the equity in the transportation to uh, have so called uh, equitable mobility. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much. That's my presentation. Uh, Should I um, answer your questions first? Or? Uh, maybe since there's questions there, we can Already? start with those. Okay. okay, let's start from. Yeah, I think I just balance this question. Yeah. Can you go down? Yeah, those are all just. They're here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's another question. Oh, okay. Hi, God. Yeah, thank you uh, for the uh, question. The, you know, this uh, tends to make it nice, pretty arbitrary, I would consider. But generally, um, I don't, mm, uh, I read some articles. People say that, you know, uh, if we can show uh, the uh, autonomous vehicles are, you know, uh, really make them choose more uh, safer than human driven vehicles, then we can convince people to give up the driving. Mm, yeah, so mm, that is uh, obviously Tesla is taking a totally different approach, right? Uh, they, they might think uh, even it's a little bit less safe than human driven, human uh, drivers, 
it might still be acceptable. Or maybe then again, this uh, tension-making line also depends on the scenarios we are considering. You know, the, the, the uh, corner cases or the rare events, you know, uh, whether, um, what, what, what kind of events, what kind of driving tasks we want to include actually matter a lot. There are a lot of discussion uh, on this, and there, there will be studies even uh, trying to collect the corner cases to design the corner cases and so on. So um, uh, I, I would consider this as a pretty mm, arbitrary, but the message is clear. Uh, if we want to, you know, have guaranteed uh, you know, safety, for example, if we even tend to negative six, then like we involve like 30 million miles driving if we change one line of code, if at least if we want to say that statistically this is guaranteed to be that safe. Yeah. So hopefully uh, this, uh, yeah, the current rate is that for human driven vehicles is generally believe it tend to negative six. I believe for airlines, depends on the hours or mileage. I think airlines actually are, are the safest, I believe, with respect to the number of fatality per mile travel. Okay. Oh, of course. Uh, can you guys read this? Is this uh, clear enough for you? No, it's too small. Maybe I should read the question. Hi, Dr. Jin. This is Xian uh, Hu from uh, Penn State. Oh, the words are out uh, because you guys have collaboration. Um, we haven't gone. I think he's saying uh, he started reading the work in 2010. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, okay, and then, okay, thank you. Uh, Sorry to read your papers around 2010 and learned a lot from okay, similar to Joe. Is that you? So you know, you know? I don't know. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, two things to hear uh, your further thoughts. One, on page 15, <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned close for, uh, oh, oh, okay, so that's the format, uh, um, acceleration for CAB. For well, the analytical formulations in decision making, uh, I thought the paper then uh, oh, <laughs> the, the, in the trifle. Could you elaborate on that? Many CAV decisions based on machine learning and or simulation analytic approach will be valuable. Okay. Two on page fourteen, you mentioned privacy preserving. This is another area that for the researchers did not pay much attention. Could you share your vision a bit more? especially how to integrate the price preserving models with transportation research needs and also struggling to persuade agencies to fund research in this area. Thanks. Oh, cool. Yeah, both are great, great um, questions. So, um, so let's get back to uh, page 15. Yeah, thank you very much for, for this. Uh, um, should I create the? Yeah, is there a keyboard? Yeah, keyboard. Someone over to that. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, definitely. New York, everything is offensive. I won't be surprised. There's something very large. I won't be surprised. I won't be surprised. I like New York City. Totally different. <laughs> Uh, 15. Yes, analytical uh, method. So basically, uh, I was looking at, you know, artificial intelligence based on no, generally no closed form um, formulation. Even adaptive cruise control, they might have, uh, you know, equations for, for example, you know, uh, 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 like uh, automatic emergency braking. There, there, there are different rules, different formulas. But they also have a collision and accident avoidance system. They have different components. Uh, you know, we know that for a complex system, each uh, subsystem might work well, but when we put them together, the whole system could behave totally you know, unexpected. 
But you know, in contrast, for car forward models, you know, especially you know, there, there are two very good review articles if you are interested in this. And these are two good review articles. Uh, they they uh, tend to use a simple uh, differential equations, like a general motor model was based on stimulus uh, re reaction uh, idea. And uh, there's um, uh, th there are other like uh, open velocity model. Uh, there's a uh, intelligent binary model, and all these models they have a closed form uh, equations. But at the same time, even though they have closed form equations. Uh, they are pretty uh, you know non-linear and when we put the multiple equations together still we can have some unexpected uh, behavior as i said actually we tested optimal velocity model which is pretty popular uh, to control the, uh, the robotic cars actually they collide into each other and uh, we we know that actually in, in uh, class we did uh, we have this assignment to uh, do simulation based on those models, then we can see the trajectories actually overlap with each other. Then, but then at that time we don't care the trajectory they overlap. But when we see that cars colliding into each other, then we will kind of shock by that. So basically, you know, they may not satisfy uh, all these uh, basic first principles. So it is very important uh, to look at them systematically. This, but then again, you know, what should be the first principles? Some, you know, as, uh, I had one citation, uh, one uh, quote earlier. Some researchers do not believe there are any first principles. But here, you know, I try to define these uh, principles and put them together, and then actually they can help to explain many uh, important phenomena. So we are just starting, and it's, uh, especially when we try to uh, have the boundary deceleration. Add this into the equation, they conflict with the earlier principles. So, what is going on? So, you suggest that you know, uh, this um, safety condition actually probably is also conditional, but we need to find on what kind of condition uh, it is safe. And also, found the jerk, and even uh, you know, we know that jerk is uh, the derivative of acceleration, right? The, Further, the uh, in the control of uh, mm, uh, those drones, there's a principle called the minimum snap principle. The why snap is a, a derivative of jerk. So you know it looks like we can uh, introduce um, we can introduce a lot of first principles, but uh, you know how to uh, first analyze the consequences. And then, uh, you know, uh, second, uh, you know, when they have conflicts, which one should we choose? Uh, you know, which principle we should stay with, right? So that hopefully that helped answer uh, the uh, first uh, question. And the second question on the privacy preserving, we are again just starting. Uh, the uh, right now we know that in the computer science area that there's this uh, technology method called differential privacy and that is uh, you know to uh, syn synthetically you know, synthesize what's the term I know basically you know when we have a travel data we do not use the real data but we use a statistically you know, average uh, you know, person to to study. We do not, you know, study the real person. Rather, we look at the statistical uh, characteristics and um, and uh, try to try uh, preserve the privacy. Well, you know, through our study of this relative space by uh, converting the trajectories, like a GPS trajectories. Okay, to the trajectory in the relative space, we feel that there's a possibility that the you know, individual user still own their GPS trajectory. And we need that for navigation. However, not this GPS, the GPS trajectory should not be uh, streamed, should not be collected by like Google, Google or Apple as they are doing right now. They uh, should 
Actually, you know, from the transportation traffic point of view, uh, it, it is sufficient to just collect their relative trajectory, which does not contain any, you know, real location. So we are trying to have this kind of stratified kind of framework um, to, um, to handle. Uh, on the one hand, we still collect meaningful traffic data. On the other hand, we uh, let the users own their privacy, own their you know, exact data. And uh, you know, this, this is also, I don't know if you guys use the Strata, you know, that is for hiking, for running. And you know, we, we have some friends. Uh, you know, if you choose to share your um, running, what do they call? They actually share your exact location, everything. But, yeah, I feel sometimes feel not comfortable to share, you know, let others know that I'm running some on some strange places. What, what do my friends might want to know is that which is my pace in the first one mile, second mile? You know, that, that actually that is uh, the relative space ID already. This relative space is not totally new. Uh, it's just look at, or actually on the navigation, they also talk about ETA estimate. You know, time arrival, we can also say um, est estimated distance to the uh, destination. That is the reality, that is uh, the space in reality space. Uh, and th that is distance in reality space already. So uh, we are still looking at this, you know, how far we can go with, uh, you know, collecting this data. Um, you know, definitely this data has some limitations. Right, so um, we we need to have more studies you know, on uh, on this. Definitely, there, there are new possibilities. Here. Okay, so hopefully, I answer your question. Uh, okay, maybe uh, the last one in the H O V land application. Is there any assumption or constraints about the system sensitivity? For example, how will the users be Codes to dynamic prices, elasticities, uh, response speed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Th these are really, really good questions um, regarding the, uh, the user's uh, behavior. And actually, you know, when, uh, this uh, is a follow up work of our earlier studies on how land prices, but earlier work, we only consider one bottleneck, but not here. We have multiple bottleneck, except that we put all this multiple bottleneck uh, in one equation. Uh, in our earlier work, indeed, uh, some reviewers raised the question that uh, sometimes uh, in reality, due to certain psychological uh, you know, uh, phenomena, actually the, with a higher price, more people actually will choose the hot land, not the other way around, which we assume you know more rational users will be you know less possible to choose a hot land if your price is high under the same condition. Because you know there's some argument there saying that you know, if people say really high price, they expect that there's something that is happening. Uh, but we counter argue with uh, maybe we should provide better information and that can help to make people more you know rational you know maybe uh, yeah so definitely you know the users are responses uh, to this right now we assume they are rational uh, meaning that under the same situation same you know congestion level on the general post land on a uh, hot land, and then with higher prices, then uh, fewer people would you know, choose a hot land. And, um, and then uh, as to elasticity, uh, I, I'm not sure if you are talking about you know, the, uh, travel, I suppose generally related to travel demand elasticity. That might be kind of relatively longer term. Thing. And uh, basically now we 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 assume you know 
the demand does not change uh, before and after implementing uh, the uh, pricing. But of course, I mean, there, there might be induced demand or suppressed demand, and uh, you know, the, the, those kind of things. Yeah. And so, so in that case, if the, the parameters in that model mm -hmm. gets changed, uh, that's just affecting the, the speed and the flow of and such, right? Yeah, yeah, that's not changing the demand, right? Basically. But we know that in the long run, yeah. you, you could change uh, the. Uh, the the, the, the demand. But you know, we feel that is a reasonable starting point to look at short run uh, response. Yeah. It is possible uh, to include the in, in those elasticity uh, into it. If, if we know some so called travel budget, uh, either in, in the money or in time, we know that that's a pretty standard. You know the carbon demand analysis. We need to take into consideration of uh, you know this 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 budget. You know this time constraints, this um, monetary um, constraints. Yeah, because if, if you set a pricing problem and you don't have elastic uh, elastic demand, you can end up with uh, like non-intuitive. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that's a good point. So here we just look at you know how the pricing would impact the. Uh, the uh, it's kind of related vouchers. Mm -hmm. It's related to vouchers, and uh, especially the within data, they, because here we are looking within data analysis. So basically, we assume you know because you know this kind of travel demand generally the number trips will change in much longer mm, term. So basically, we are looking at you know given. Mm, uh, if, if, if uh, people are not yet uh, uh, quick enough to respond to the pricing, but of course, I mean, uh, by um, incorporating this um, uh, this elasticity externally, this system will still work. But just the next day, we run with another type of demand level. And then try to design uh, the uh, pricing. Yeah. So that definitely, I mean, uh, if we want to internalize it, if we want to close the loop, that would be um, more uh, that would be uh, more attractive, but at the same time more challenging because we really have to look into you know the socioeconomic characteristics here. And that we know that that is not straightforward. I definitely, you know, conceptually we can incorporate it. However, mathematically or mathematically or methodologically, we do not feel it will make huge difference. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I said that the response speed actually um, here is also there's a huge assumption here. Basically, we assume that. You know, when the vehicle entering the corridor, we present the vehicle, the current speed on the hot lane, uh, on the hot lane, on general purpose lane, and present the price, and then let the drive decide. And only once. So this is also simplification. So, um, yeah, so uh, to, to, to get to, um, um, you know, one property uh, which is not um, um, emphasized in the transportation systems related to your stability, you know, whether the system actually is stable. Because we know that mathematically in physics, if a system is not stable, then a small change in anything or random error will drive the system totally away from what we want to achieve. Then that will make an analysis in you know, the optimization or whatever. For example, we have an optimal solution, but this is not stable. Then in you know, the real world could be totally you know, different. So here we emphasize a lot on achieving uh, a stable uh, optimal state. So um, yeah, so that that, that would be uh, my answer. So hopefully. Uh, that answer your question. 
Any further questions? That's it for the okay, cool. Uh, how about uh, folks yeah. in attendance? Uh, any questions? Yes, just feel free to ask a question related to this or anything else related to transportation or anything else. I'll try to relate to transportation or traffic flow theory. <laughs> try to have a traffic flow model. Uh, I have a question. So, <clears throat> so it seems like uh, the the models that you're working with here, uh, like the bathtub model, mm -hmm. you, your the underlying assumption is that uh, it satisfies like the macroscopic fundamental value. Um, but if your if it doesn't, uh, then yeah. it, it can that can be you would then have to have more equations, right? I yes, guess. exactly. So we know that you know, this uh, network from the diagram is a big assumption. However, there's data to support it. Yeah, yeah in, in a network like uh, in a Japan right. and, uh, and in uh, some, they said, um, if, if uh, we know that uh, if the links are relatively homogeneous, they have the same characteristic, same traffic condition, this can be uh, shown to be true. Uh, you know, actually, our study shows that shows that uh, this is definitely sufficient condition, but does not need to be necessary. So this existence of a metal from a uh, can be under broader situation. But then again, I mean, the real world is not accurate, and uh, this will serve as a really good starting point. And uh, after this, maybe we can move one level lower. To see if still makes sense, if we use a little more realistic or a little more detailed. But then again, you know, for uh, you know, you, 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 you guys you probably heard of self transmission model. Self transmission model is more detailed, however, it depends on a lot on the, how to model the merging, diverging, those intersection behavior. Actually, those could also lead to a lot of problems. And or if we want further to move down to the car following those microscopic lens changing model, we can do that. Mm, and uh, can, we can see if this uh, pricing scheme, this management design still makes sense with those things. But at the same time, I said, I always, you know, I, since I've been working with these different level of models, I always consider, for example, the car following model definitely more detailed. I, I agree. However, uh, more detail does not mean it's more accurate because the system is so much more complicated. If a small thing, car falling behavior, lynch behavior, merging, diverging behavior is model slightly wrong, the whole system could be totally off. And then maybe the result may not be even better than the uh, course. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it's it's very interesting. And like, um, maybe it's possible to, I don't know if you apply this to like uh, some data sets. Uh, uh, there's, I mean, there's like the shared mobility uh, case, for example, or even the TNCs and taxis. Yeah. Uh, right. So then they only said, I mean, uh, in Berkeley School, Germans, they, they will look at a lot of data and, uh, and uh, on the microscopic fundamental diagram. Uh, there have been a lot of study. And of course, a network from the diagram was proposed back in the 1960s. Already, they work on the Ipswich Town Center in the right. uh, they, they already observed this uh, equity level speed thanks to the relationship. Right, but but in terms of the application mm -hmm. that you have to like uh, uh, for the later uh, work, with the yeah, shared right. mobility systems. Exactly, shared mobility. Uh, share uh, share mobility. If it's a town center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of data, I mean, a lot of work can be done. But how to collect this data would be a big challenge. Yeah. But maybe this privacy preserving idea could help right. to collect more data. Right. I mean, so, so there are some public data sources like, uh, like taxi pickup or uh, Uber. Uh, yeah, New York City, yeah. and Uber in the Chicago. And yeah. we've been looking at that. But you know, for network from the background, we should have a uh, reasonable uh, sample size. Uh, in order, because still we have a lot of POVs in the network, yeah. right? Yeah. So just Uber, I don't know, maybe 10% at most, something like that, whether that's accurate enough or something. 
So there are still a lot of challenges. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah, and, uh, but, the, but actually this year in the chat, we are focusing on review uh, entanglement from it. Try to use a machine learning method to calibrate the models. Oh, yeah, I might have sent that to you. <laughs> <laughs> I might have sent that to paper to you. Well, I haven't got the notation. Yeah. Maybe from you. Also. Yeah, mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there, there, there are uh, work uh, in this area. And, uh, mm, but yeah, as I said, mm, the traditional, I did not get to the details, but you know, the existing one by a Berkeley school, uh, they did not have a, a partial differential equation, they have an ordinal differential equation. But they, they now it's clear this ordinal differential equation is only valid when we have the trip distance follow the negative exponential distribution. But we know that actually we did some you know, over in this study. Definitely it's not negative exponential distribution. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's a lot normal, will match better, something like that. So uh, to look at those things, I mean, we consider this a new paradigm, and actually I'm also doing some work trying to use this idea. This is just consider one neighborhood or say one downtown area as one entity. Definitely this can substantially simplify the, the whole network, the regional network. And this could have a you know, bigger impact on planning side. I mean, on the planning side, I mean, sometimes do we really care about the speed and type of thing, right? Maybe the downtown area, suburban area, and these things make more sense to plan many things. And also for a multi modal system, this can be a naturally applied to a multi modal system because we, we still have. You know, uh, the, we can have one best hub for subway system, one best hub for you know, street type of thing, or maybe one best hub for buses. Yeah. This can uh, substantially help to simplify uh, the modeling of a complex network. This could lead to some new uh, insights, which we might not be aware of, some simple ones. Rather than, you know, you know, if you've been working with simulation, you know that it takes a lot of time to set up a network, to calibrate, you know, all those things already, right? But here, sounds like we might have a simpler, you know, much simpler starting point and then help us to solve larger scale problems. 